Thanks, Janet. So the one thing you didn't hear in uh, that introduction is any sense that I'm an expert on benefit-cost analysis. Um, so it's great to be paired with Margaret, who clearly knows this stuff you know, really, really well. Uh, and uh, looking through the panel, it seemed like that was often a you know, pairing of people who were experts with other folks. So what I bring, what I am, is more of a person who's trained as an econometrician who's done social policy evaluations for the past 20 years. So I'm viewing it more from the lens of you know, using cost-benefit analyses, seeing them done on the projects that I'm working on, and you know, and some of those implications, but also very much from the lens of somebody who worries about you know, statistical inference and you know, what, what the implications are of that. Um, I also, uh, you'll see my slides are incredibly boring, so I was very impressed by Margaret's slides and how, how beautiful they were and the great graphics. I don't have any pictures or anything like that, so yeah, bear with me. Um, I know at the end of this session I'm gonna be chopped from my you know, presentation and, and so on. Do I, how do I get it to go forward? So I just want to start out with a couple of examples from MDRC's work. You know, again, and this will be my presentation will be you know from the perspective of what MDRC has done, especially, but also you know broader than that. But but that definitely informs it. So one example, an old one that uh, was probably done about 10 years ago, the Minnesota Family Investment Program uh, was was fairly you know influential, got a lot of attention. It was a welfare to work program that provided financial work incentives to you know, welfare recipients in uh, Minnesota, as well as providing them with um, a mandate to, to work or participate in welfare to work services, and um, provided them with some support, such as help finding formal child care and so on. So kind of a range of both you know, of things to try to encourage people to work. And the study did increase employment and income. Um, at the same time, MFIP was one of the studies that was done around the same time that found that increasing family income also had improvements for kids. And in particular, it improved children's academic achievement, especially young children. Um, so it, it felt like it fit in well with this because even though it wasn't intended to do that, it was a, a, a you know, study that certainly you know, helped children and, um, and uh, well, help children, so it fits in well. The benefit cost results over five years um, show that obviously it improved participants' economic well, economic well being, it increased their employment and income. It cost the government about $2,000 a year. One thing it didn't do, though, however, is monetize the benefits, some of the other benefits. It monetized the things that were already in dollars, but it didn't monetize benefits uh, that came from other sources, such as child well being, the academic achievement outcomes that I just mentioned. There were other family inc outcomes, such as increases in uh, the rate of marriage between program and control group members. There were distributional effects of these things. Some people worked more, some people worked less. That had uh, influences. It didn't attempt to monetize all of those, but presented other kinds of benefits, you know, in, in costs as pluses and minuses to go on top of the, um, top of the, uh, the, the basic benefit cost results. Uh, also, as I mentioned here, there was no measure of uncertainty presented, and that's a theme I want to come back to because it, certainly in the MDRC work, but I think in a, a lot of benefit cost analysis I've seen elsewhere, that's, that's true. A second example is Foundations of Learning, um, which is a more recent study, an intervention to help Head Start teachers in their classroom management, especially with behavior, be, you know, children with behavior problems, uh, and also to provide mental health consultants to um, you know, to those to those classrooms, and the goal was to improve kids' problem behavior and improve uh, you know classroom management. The results suggested that it did, in fact, achieve some of those goals. It did improve how well the teachers were able to manage the classrooms, and it reduced problem behavior. But it didn't seem to have other um, other benefits for children once they went into school. And in particular, it didn't seem to increase their academic skills as measured by things like math and you know and reading scores. Uh, the cost benefit results from that study are really focused on the costs. It was 1750 per child. It didn't really, couldn't really say much about the benefits because there weren't impacts on things that could be easily monetized. You know, one of the goals, for example, may have been to look at how many children avoided being in special ed. There's a you know, real cost of being in special ed, so that would be something that would be easily monetized. It's much more difficult to monetize reductions in problem behavior in a Head Start classroom. And Lynn, you know, Carly worked with us on, on that, so she can answer all the questions about it. <laughs> How about this if you have them? Um, we were also asked just to mention you know, examples of policy influencing benefit cost analyses. And so there are a couple here, one of which is a prevention program that everybody knows, and the other of which is you know, not a prevention program, but uh, I thought was kind of interesting to look at. The first is the Nurse Family Partnership, which of course every paper I've ever read on benefit cost analysis for you know, kids talks about. Um, a home visiting program for first time pregnant women, studied in three randomized control trials. The Coalition for Evidence 
evidence-based policy recently, you know, declared it met its first year for being an effective program. Um, it, and one of the great things about the NFP studies is that at least one of them had a 20-year follow-up. So it could look at what were the benefits for children as they got older. And it found improvements and reductions in the cost of health care, uh, reductions in welfare use that uh, saved money, and reductions in criminal activity when those children became adults. So it saved money. The reason I put it here is because it still is influencing policy in the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. There's one and a half billion dollars placed uh, for home visiting programs, a little bit of that for studying those home visiting programs, but most of it for actually implementing home visiting programs across the country. So a pretty big chunk of money for that. And these home visiting programs operate in every state, and there are you know, thousands of examples of them. Uh, in addition, it's currently reimbursed through some state Medicaid programs. If you look at the New York State Medicaid regulations, for example, it has very clear regulations that don't mention the Nurse Family Partnership, but it reimburses for things that exactly meet the, the characteristics of the Nurse Family Partnership. A second is uh, the Center for Employment Opportunities Study, CEO, which MDRC, which it did, which is a transitional jobs program for former prisoners. Um, CEO reduced recidivism, depending on how you look at it, for some subgroups and some time periods, but the cost of being in prison for a day is so great that even a relatively small reduction in recidivism resulted in, you know, in pretty substantial cost savings. And the results have been used to expand, this is a study that was done in New York City originally, and the results have been used to expand it to several cities in upstate New York. So I thought it was, you know, it, I think the benefit cost analysis did help to, help to, uh, to make that go. The other thing that both of these two um, policy influencing benefit, benefit cost analyses have in common, I think, besides being cost beneficial, is that they had strong spokespeople. Um, David Olds from NFP has, has been really great at letting people know and helping people understand the results. And uh, the, the woman who runs the Center for Employment Opportunities in New York City is also very, you know, a strong believer in her program and has helped to uh, disseminate it to other places. So I just want to touch upon, we were asked to really you know, think about a range of different things. So I'm going to touch briefly upon a number of different, uh, different things that I've seen in you know, relation to benefit cost analysis. Just a few challenges related to measuring costs. Um, the first that I think is, is especially you know, tr problematic sometimes in prevention programs for kids is how do you, what do you do with one-time costs? In foundations of learning, for example, teachers were trained um, and there was the cost of you know, putting them through training at the beginning, and two cohorts of, of uh, Head Start children were studied. But presumably, those teachers who were trained, if they stay in their jobs, will be able to keep you know, benefiting kids and reducing problem behavior and having well-managed classrooms for years to come. So how do you take those costs that were initially incurred and spread them out over, uh, over a period of time? Or, or do, you, do you do that? That's, I think, an issue that would be great to have more standards about. In the Foundations of Learning study, they didn't attempt to try to you know, do that probably in part because the you know the benefits weren't there. Um, another related uh, question is, what do you do with demonstration programs versus ongoing programs? And FOL I think is a good illustration of that. The study that we did incurred the full costs of training for those Head Start teachers. But Head Start teachers go through training in the course of their work anyway. So it's possible that in an ongoing program, that training would have been added to other training and that would have reduced the costs of administering it. MDRC measured the cost of actually implementing it for the first time, but perhaps the right way to think about it is what would have been the cost of folding that into uh, an existing training for Head Start teachers. So what are the standards around how you deal with these kind of one-time costs in demonstration you know, projects versus ongoing? Um, Margaret mentioned some of these harder to measure costs, such as in-kind contributions and volunteer work, so opportunity costs and so on. Definitely tough stuff to, to think about. But the other thing that, I, that strikes me, definitely looking at MDRC studies, but more broadly, I think, is just how little is done in trying to express statistical uncertainty about the benefit cost results. And I was struck by you know, a paper that Lynn wrote, Lynn Carley wrote about um, exactly the topic of this of this panel session. I mean, uh, standards for for these uh, things. And she noted that only three of the the number of studies she had looked at had expressed some sort of statistical uncertainty. And um, you know, so even there, it seems like it's it's pretty rare. And the way I you know phrase it here, if you have something that has a one dollar net benefit and you know that that's, you know, it has a standard error of one cent, that may lead to very different conclusions than if it has a standard error of $1 million. And it seems like knowing you know, how certain you are about the result seems key rather than just knowing what that number is. Um, and it's it just, you know, it's obviously one of the underlying principles in doing impact analyses, and it's, it's interesting that it's not something that's, that's taken into account nearly as much here, and I think it would be really interesting to hear more about that topic and see if there are standards around 
how to express statistical uncertainty uh, and how to use those numbers. You know, one thing, as I say on the bottom of the slide, that I think shouldn't be done is to use significance testing in thinking about statistical uncertainty. It seems like whether something is significant at the 5% level or 10% level or whatever you choose, it's not really the right um, framework for making policy decisions. What you'd like to know is whether the intervention you're studying saves money, perhaps, or has meets some other objective. But whether it's significantly different from zero is, you know, is the wrong thing. And uh, the literature talks a lot about doing Monte Carlo simulations, and that seems like a perfect framework for thinking about what is the probability, say, that an intervention has, you know, positive costs. So just to give you a little illustration, uh, here are two hypothetical results. One, there was an average benefit of $400, net benefit, say, with a standard error of 200 we'd say that was statistically significant. Um, the second one, same average benefit of 400, but the standard error now is 300, it's not significant. Why treat those two things completely differently? There's more uncertainty in one, so you should treat them a little bit differently, but why completely indifferently? If you look at, these are um, distributions of the likely effects given the mean effect of 400 and the standard errors that we came up. Even the uh, result that is not significant, if you look at the distribution of effects, there's a 90.9% chance that they're positive. There's a 91% chance that this intervention saves money. So why wouldn't you be interested in thinking about implementing that, even though the result is not statistically significantly different from zero? Um, just thinking about that a little bit more, and I was struck, I got, you know, Margaret was way more prepared than I was, so I got a chance to look at her slides, um, you yeah, before she got a ch chance to look at mine, and I was struck by her question, should we include results that are not statistically significant? And it seems like the answer should be, yeah, again, from the point of view of, a, of somebody who thinks about this from a statistical perspective, absolutely, you should, you know, if they're, if they're the right results. Um, statistical significance is not the thing that you should be focusing on. It would be like um, doing an impact analysis and say, we're only going to present the results that are statistically significant, and all the other things, that, all the other outcomes that we looked at that weren't, we're just, you know, going to ignore. Nobody would ever do a study like that because it would lead to the wrong conclusions about, uh, about, um, about the effects of the intervention. And I think the same is, is true as Margaret pointed out, the results vary so much depending on whether you include the non-statistically significant results. Um, it seems like instead what you want to do is design the benefit-cost analysis ahead of time and think about where are you, where do you think you'll have estimates of benefits and costs that will be pretty good ones, pretty precise ones, and build your benefit-cost analysis around that. Rather than looking at the results later, say here's where we think we'll have the good, good numbers and, um, and include those in your analysis later. Um, and part of, part of my thinking, too, is that you know, one of the things that Margaret said is that they weren't as confident in the results that weren't statistically significant. And that's not always the case. You could have two results where the standard error is exactly the same, the confidence interval is exactly the same, but one is larger than the other. You're equally confident in those two things, but one just happens to be larger than the other. So it's not really a matter of confidence. Um, but what this suggests, though, is that you might want to omit some things if there's just a huge amount of uncertainty in the results. Maybe just don't include that in your benefit-cost analysis when you're designing it. So just to throw out two straw men, which I don't think people actually do, one example is to do 20-year projections from a, you know, a home visiting program that's targeted at infants, project 20 years into the future from NFP about you know, what their your reduction in, in criminal activity will be and how much more they'll earn and how much lower their welfare benefits will be. Or another example where I think there is more thinking is to take outcomes where there's not really a lot of information to monetize them, but let's try to monetize them anyway because they seem like important outcomes. And maybe, you know, improvements in uh, social emotional development in a study like Foundations of Learning might be an example of that. And I know there were some musings about trying to monetize that you know, ahead of time. The team, you know, didn't go in that direction later. And just, you know, another one of these, I like these PDFs just to break up the text. So here's that uh, benefit we showed before, mean of $400 and standard error of 200, and this is just the distribution of effects centered around 400. Let's say there was a second benefit in this intervention as well, and it had a mean uh, net benefit of $100 with a standard error of 200, and you added those two things together, and they were independent, so you could just add them together. Here's how that would have affected the, you know, the, the what the distribution of results would have looked like. Um, now it's centered around 500. There's a bigger benefit, but there's a lot more uncertainty in it as well. It's not too bad, though. It's, it's, it's still mostly above zero. But what if you had another benefit where you just really did not have a good sense of what the monetary benefit of that, that component was? Again, it has a mean of $100, so it's adding to the net benefit, but it has a huge, you know, huge standard error. Now we're left with um, a distribution that's pretty flat. You can't even, it's really hard to see that it peaks at around 600. So six hundred dollars. Um, I can see it from here now that I look at it from this angle, but not, you know, not from here. Um, 
And so it seems like maybe the way to think about it is you try to avoid things that will create that amount of uncertainty. I think the uncertainty is important to, to um, take into account. So I, this has some implications, I think, as, we, as I've just been saying, for monetizing benefits. Some are obviously easier to monetize than other. Uh, reductions in criminal justice activity that are observed because of the high cost of you know, being in the criminal justice system are, are really important. But externalizing behavior of kids yeah, you know, maybe it's something that's much harder to, uh, you know, to, to uh, monetize. Or, um, you know, looking at, for example, infants, if your goal is to improve birth outcomes and reduce the use of the neonatal intensive care unit, there's a really concrete cost associated with that that seems like it would be great to get a handle on. But if you're trying to improve infant cognitive development at the same time, that's something that's going to be much more, you know, blurry in terms of its monetary benefits down the road. Um, likewise, some effects are just more certain than others. Near, near term versus long term, obviously, yeah, will be more certain. Director versus indirect effects. I've seen discussion, for example, of thinking about how interventions for children might affect their peers or affect their siblings. And you know, do you want to take those into account? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Just you know, kind of throwing it out there. Is it something that's so hard to get a handle on that it just will create too much noise? Um, you know, in MFIP. And in a lot of MDRC studies, those other outcomes that are hard to monetize are just summarized with a series of pluses and minuses. So you focus on the things that you really feel confident about um, and you know, draw inferences about the cost-benefit uh, framework from that, and then just say there are a bunch of other things that might make this you know, even better or worse, and here's how to think about it. Uh, I think what was striking about NFP and Perry Preschool, which you know, often talked about, is just that they did have long-term follow-ups. They didn't have to project 20 years, or in the case of Perry Preschool, 40 years. Um, they actually had some results on which to, you know, to base their cost-benefit analysis. So that made their results a little bit more you know, certain. Um, I think it has some implications for generalizability and you know, scale-up. This is an issue that's really been an obsession, I think, of people doing designing studies, um, and certainly from the point of view of you know, kind of doing impact analyses. If you do a study, can you really, in, a one, in one location, for example, can you really generalize it to, you know, to a wider group? Or what if you take you know, a study like Perry Preschool or NFP that was done in, you know, really great conditions, what are the implications of that for something that you'd be putting into place in you know, much more general circumstances? So I think that would be something to really, be, you know, maybe too, too tough to address, but that would be the sort of area that I think would be great to have some standards on. How do you use the results from efficacy trials? Um, one approach that I've seen used with NFP recently is to just assume that the benefits will be lower, that once you put it in place in a lot of different areas, it'll be 30% less than what you know, NFP found in its three random, you know, random, randomized trials. Um, but there may be other approaches or, or as well. Another question is just how applicable are, applicable are the results to other groups? If you, you're doing a study or have some estimates from one group, then how do you, you know, do you have to you know, modify it or think about how much uncertainty is, is uh, built in when you try to apply it to other, you know, other subgroups? In um, you know, the world of social policy evaluation, you know, this has led to thinking more about doing multi-site um, you know, uh, studies like the one that Margaret presented, so I think that's, that's great. Um, and more generally, you know, just thinking about how the results will change with the assumptions that come in. And then finally, just a few more implications of, uns of the uncertainty lens on a couple of things that uh, were in our um, agenda for this session. Um, on diversity of outcomes, yeah, we've already kind of talked about this. It seems like from this perspective, you want to focus on the key outcomes that you'll have some confidence in that you expect to change rather than trying to you know, monetize everything. So it seems like maybe the standards should indicate that it's okay to monetize only the things that you can do with reasonable certainty. Um, in terms of the recipient of the benefits, um, it seems like you would measure as many relevant benefits as possible, but um, you know, in which of those you can monetize is, is hard to say. In terms of target age of the child, that seems less important than what, what you're trying to influence and whether that can be monetized as the, you know, the example with infants, you know, the NICU versus cognitive development was you know, meant, to, uh, meant to indicate. And then different baseline groups, it just seems like there's a lot of caution that needs to be uh, taken into account in generalizing from one group or one study to, uh, to a larger group or a larger study. And so some standards in thinking about how to take you know, from one place and apply to another would be really, really you know, helpful, I'm sure. And, in case you couldn't find it somewhere else, here's my email address. Thank you.